Shalom. I'm uh, Rabbi Arthur Wasco. I'm director of the Shalom Center. And I realize I have right here on the table with me uh, three mm, elements of truth, of wisdom, that I want to share with you because they come together for me as profound teachings of what it means to be uh, bringing a prophetic voice, a prophetic uh, way of looking at American society, at Judaism itself, at religious life in general. And actually, I also realize I'm wearing one of these. This shirt, if its symbols are mysterious, says Shalom equals Salam. That is Shalom, the Hebrew, uh, for peace and harmony, equals Salam, a uh, Semitic uh, word from the same deep root as shalom, uh, only in Arabic, also means peace. So what are these three elements out of which uh, I want to talk uh, today? So one of them, in a sense the oldest, though another one may be in some strange way older, is this, a translation of what Jews call the Chumash, the five books that we call the five books of Moses, uh, the Heart of Torah, a translation by Everett Fox. And the reason I love this translation so much is that it um, brings the Hebrew into English. It doesn't present a kind of idiomatic, easy English. It comes out feeling poetic. It draws on the Hebrew's word plays, on the breathing patterns. Edward Fox was studying uh, the great theologians Martin Buber and Franz Rosenzweig, great German theologians of the mid 20th century. And together they translated the Hebrew scriptures into German in a way that was intended to bring the Hebrew alive in German. Um, and Fox got so fascinated and excited by what he was studying that he decided to try to do it in English and has now done it not only for the five books but he's continuing into the prophets and other passages. So that's one. I said that was the oldest but of course green life is even older than the Torah. What the two of them have in common is the ancient name one of the ancient names for God in Hebrew Yud, He, Vov, He, in the Western alphabet Y, H, W, H. And when I once upon a time decided to break the rules and try pronouncing Y, H, W, H with no vowels, so it's not Yahweh and it's not Yehovah, what came out for me was a breath. And the breath of life, the interbreathing of all life, because it's what this green plant breathes out, the oxygen that it breathes out, is what I need to breathe in. <coughs> and what I breathe out, the CO2, I breathe out is what this green plant and all green plants need in order to breathe in and keep alive. So in a way the breath of life yeah, is at the root of Torah and at the root of the green plant and in a different way at the root of this third piece of wisdom and truth. And in a way, also at the root of this third aspect of wisdom and truth, this vinyl phonograph record made in the 60s of the voices of the civil rights movement in Albany, Georgia. And that's the way the folks of Albany pronounce it, not like Albany, New York. Albany. And I'm going to be explaining in a minute why <laughs> this uh, recording is so important for me. Uh, in fact, let me read just the first sentence of the back. In October of 1961, 
Charles Sherrod, Cordell Reagan, and Charles Jones came to Albany as a team of SNCC representatives to help register Negro voters. Still in the 60s, people use the word Negro rather than Black or African American. And this photograph is of a pray-in um, about voter registration and about ending segregation. And one of the figures here is Reverend Charles Sherrod, a name that very few Americans might have remembered, though for sure the people who were involved in the civil rights movement of the 60s remembered, until very recently when his wife, Shirley Sherrod, became truly famous in American society. <coughs> and that's what I want to talk about. I want to talk about Sherrod, that's what he was called by everybody. He wasn't called Charles, he wasn't called Charlie or Chuck, and he wasn't called Reverend. He was called simply Sherrod. In 1963, he, like some other workers in the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC, pronounced SNCC, the sort of growing edge of the civil rights movement, the sit-in movement, the Freedom Riders, and the voting registration movement in the South, came for typically a few months at a time to where I was in Washington, D.C., at the Institute for Policy Studies, a Center for Progressive Thought and Action. They came for time to think, to talk, to share their experiences and to breathe outside of the intense and harrowing atmosphere experience of what it meant to be risking your life day after day, hour after hour, if you were working for civil rights and voting rights in the South during that period of time. And so I got to meet Sherrod. At the Institute, we were in touch with a number of members of Congress. Some of us, including me, had actually worked on Capitol Hill as legislative assistants to members of Congress. And since Sherrod was visiting us and talking with us about what life had been like in Albany, we decided to invite about a dozen members of Congress to come and listen to him do a seminar on what life was like in Albany. This was before the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 or the Voting Rights Act of 1965. And Congress was still mm, hovering on the edge of whether it was actually prepared to take serious action to protect civil rights and voting rights and end segregation in the South. So we arranged a seminar one evening with about a dozen members of Congress and some of the fellows of the Institute for Policy Studies and Sherrod. And he began, as you might expect, a seminar like this would begin, by speaking in a kind of calm observer way, almost the way a reporter might, about what life was like in Albany. And then he began to talk about the churches, especially the black churches of Albany, and his own role as a young minister in those churches, a young minister committed to the biblical teachings of the holiness of human beings, the teaching that all human beings are made in the image of God, the biblical teaching that justice, justice, you shall pursue, that you should pursue just visions of the future by just actions in the present. That's why the Torah says justice, justice twice. Otherwise, it would have just said it once. And slowly, as he began describing the churches and the way they were engaged in action, and as he began describing these moments 
of prayer, but prayer in the streets, not just inside the churches, but prayer in the streets, challenging those in power with the truth of biblical wisdom. Slowly, he stopped being a reporter or an observer. And he started giving, teaching, speaking the kind of sermon that he taught and spoke in one of the churches in Albany. And the room was transformed. He had suddenly brought us from a place of intellect and a place of political concern, because those members of Congress who had come were certainly concerned about justice in the South. But he had moved all of us to a place of soul, a place of spirit, a place of heart. Those members of Congress were clearly transfixed, electrified, and so was I. None of us had had anything like the experience of a gospel sermon which was about the world, the world of injustice, the vision of justice, of God carrying the people on eagle's wings to a place of justice. <coughs> None of us in that room had ever experienced such a sermon. And suddenly, we weren't just in a seminar room in Washington, D.C., at the Institute for Policy Studies. We were in a church, a synagogue, a mosque, a place of prayer, a place of passion, a place of soul. The members of Congress left that night transformed, and so did I. This was in 1963. It wasn't until 1968, about five years later, on the Passover night that came a week after Dr. Martin Luther King was murdered, that the deep meaning of that moment with Charles Sherrod became fulfilled for me. The deep moment of the total unity, the synthesis of prayer, of Torah, and of justice through action came inside me that night of Passover in 1968 in the wake of Dr. King's death. There had been other moments before that, in a sense, prepared me. Perhaps this was the first one. And I will share with you the other stories, the stories of singing the freedom songs that are about the exodus from ancient Pharaoh that Fanny Lou Haber sang. The speech that Dr. King gave the night before he was killed, in which he, like Moses, spoke of standing on the mountainside looking into the promised land and knowing that he might not get there, just as Moses did not get there, but that the people would. Those moments were the moments that prepared me for the deep transformation in my life that brought me to becoming a rabbi, brought me to seeking to renew and transform Judaism itself. Not only to renew it internally, but to make it a way of thought and action and prayer and commitment that would also help to transform and renew the world alongside other communities of faith, communities of ethics. So this was a crucial beginning for me. And together with the world of earth and green and the world of 
the ancient wisdom of our forebears, Torah, and all that has grown from it. All that growing constantly, these seeds of change for me brought me to where I am now, the Shalom Center, working to heal the earth, to make a world of justice, to make a world of peace, to make a world where indeed Shalom and Salam can stand together, not just on a shirt, but in our fullest reality. Shalom again, and I hope we'll continue to be in touch.